The basic definition of symmetry in mathematics involves the idea of motion. So if we're going to do a study of symmetry, the first thing we need to understand is what are the allowable motions. Now we're going to use an extra word here, which is maybe unnecessary. We're going to use the word rigid and talk about rigid motions. Those are the only ones we want to consider. Now what is a rigid motion? A rigid motion is a motion which preserves the size and shape of an object. For example, a rotation is a rigid motion. A reflection is a rigid motion. What's something that's not a rigid motion? Well, imagine that you have a photograph and you enlarge it. That's changing the size, so that's not considered to be a rigid motion. Similarly, rigid motions don't allow shrinking. They don't allow stretching. They don't allow tearing or bending. With a rigid motion, we won't allow ourselves, for example, to take a rectangle and then to shear it over on the side, changing the angles. Okay, that's changing the shape. So, now that we know what a rigid motion is, I want to tell you an important basic fact about them. This is working in the plane, and that will be true throughout the unit, we're working in the plane. In the plane, there are four types of rigid motions. And they begin with the four letters that I've indicated there. R, R, T, G. Now, you're probably thinking you know what those first two are, and I'm thinking that you also know, I think you're right, they are rotations and reflections. And the third type that we're about to learn about is called translation. There's a fourth type beginning with the letter G, but we'll learn about that in another lecture. So, translation. What is a translation? A translation is a motion which moves every point the same distance and direction. So here's a simple example. Consider that maroon looking blob that I'm showing you there and then push it upward to the right as indicated by that arrow there. So move it exactly the distance indicated by the arrow and move it in the direction indicated by the arrow. Every point is moved the same distance and direction. Now that arrow when it's used for that purpose in mathematics and physics is called a vector. A vector is an arrow used to specify a distance and direction, especially when you want to think of it as a motion in that distance and direction. Now, returning to reflections, what information is needed to specify a reflection? The answer is you just need to name a line. Name a line, specify a line, that line tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. That line is called the axis of the reflection. Now, once you're given the line, what does it do to a point? It takes that point and it moves it to a point on the other side of the axis, not any point at all, not, not a, a randomly chosen point, a very specific point, namely the point which lies opposite it in the following sense. It's the same distance from the axis but on the other side. And if you draw in the line segment between the two points, it will be perpendicular to the axis. Now, if you try to apply that recipe to points on the axis, well, they're already on the axis. And so you, again, are supposed to get a point on the axis. Well, a point that's on the axis, in fact, doesn't get moved. It just stays where it is. So we say that the points on the axis are fixed points. All right, same question for rotation. What information is needed to specify a rotation? The answer now is actually two pieces of information. The first thing you need to say is, where is the center of rotation? That's a point. As I've said, it's called the center of rotation, or it sometimes can be called rotocenter. I find that a sort of ugly word and don't use it a lot, but this is the word that you'll find in the book. Now, that's not enough. You also need to specify an angle. You need to say rotate, say, 90 degrees or 120 degrees. Also, you need to say which direction. You see there's two ways one could rotate, clockwise or counterclockwise, so you need to say. So you might say something like, consider the rotation with this center by 90 degrees clockwise. 
And in fact, I'm showing you an example where it is a rotation 90 degrees clockwise about a specified rotocenter. Point P is being moved to point P prime, which is sometimes called the image of P. Notice that P and P prime are exactly the same distance from the rotocenter, and that if you draw in the line segments connecting those two points to the center, they form exactly a right angle. It's supposed to be a rotation through a right angle. The same thing with Q and Q prime. What you're supposed to do if you're asked to rotate an object is to follow that recipe and apply it to every point. So if you begin with the key that's shown on the left and rotate it by 90 degrees about the indicated roto center, you'll get the key shown on the right. Again, this slide repeats some of what I said already. Each point P is moved to a point P prime lying the same distance from the roto center. The angle formed at the roto center by the lines out to P and P prime is the specified angle. Finally, let's ask our question about a translation. What information is needed to specify a translation? Well, you could give either one of two equivalent answers. You could either say a distance and direction, or equivalently, to be fancy, you can say a vector, an arrow that indicates that distance and direction. Now, there are no fixed points here, since every point is moved the same distance and in the same direction. So to review a little bit, I want to go back about fixed points. For a reflection, every point on the axis is fixed, that is to say, not moved. For a rotation, only the center is unmoved. Everything else gets moved. And finally, for a translation, nothing is moved.